So um, as you come into the webinar, please just type in the chat that where you're located. That way we can um, make sure that you can hear us and that we have connection. Um, we're just gonna give it a minute while people enter. Um, we're already up to 22, so we'll just um, let this go for a little bit. Um, today in Virginia, which is where I'm located, it's a rather gray overcast day. So this is a view behind me of Rappahannock County where I live. Um, I just went and picked up some great native plants to put in my yard, which uh, gardening is kind of my, my hobby um, when I'm not traveling around the world. Great, so we've got people from Illinois, Maryland, California, Pennsylvania, Georgia, awesome. We're up to 52. Um, sound okay, if anybody cannot hear me, just put it in the chat and we'll um, do what we can. So, looks like slowed down. All right. So, uh, welcome everybody. Today my guest is Dr. Sherry Johnson. Dr. Johnson and I met each other at the AAP meeting in Denver, Colorado this winter, and it turns out she's a huge fan of Surefoot. So we've been um, talking and I invited her to come on because Sherry has a really interesting perspective on using Surefoot pads. Um, as a veterinarian, she's gonna be looking at things different than what say I would be looking at as a riding instructor. So I'm really excited today to hear about Sherry and how she's using Surefoot and share that with everybody. Um, Sherry, please just give us a little bit of, of your uh, background, your bio. I, it's so interesting. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks so much for having me, Wendy. Um, I've been really excited to collaborate with you and I kind of fangirled when I met you because I had been using <laughs> the pads for so long and to put a face with the name was awesome. Um, so I, I do have a slide um, in my slide deck that kind of introduces my formal particulars, but um, I live in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, I did a sports medicine and rehab residency equine specific through Colorado State University and have transitioned into a PhD program here. So I wear a lot of hats. Um, I definitely straddle the, the bridge between academia and private practice, and I'm, um, I'm thankful to be kind of in both worlds. And didn't you just receive an award? <laughs> uh, I did. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I am very honored. Um, this year I was named the 2020 storm cat, um, award recipient from the Grayson jockey club research foundation. So, um, it's a huge, huge honor to, to get that award. It's very prestigious and, um, I look forward to continuing my, my research. That's it's awesome. And, um, I'm just, I'm so excited to have uh, you share with us how you're using Surefoot because I know it's quite different than the way I use it, um, but you have the credentials to do things different. And so um, I get a lot of questions about rehabilitating horses and neurologic horses. And I, my perspective is ask your vet. Um, so today we get to ask you and, and I'm sure that if people have questions, you can just put it in the chat. And then if I see a good moment, um, I'll ask Dr. Johnson the questions and we'll, we'll roll like that. Sounds yeah, good? that sounds great. Great. That sounds All great. Right. So I know you have a slideshow to share. So why don't we just go ahead and get into okay. it? Let's just get into it. Let me know, Wendy, when that looks good on your end. Yep. And if you just start the slideshow, the menu bar will go away. Perfect. Perfect. Does that look yeah. good? Awesome. Looks great. And I'll, awesome. I'll occasionally just close the window on the side to show, because the upper right hand corner can get lost a little bit if I have um, the window open to see you, but I'll, it'll come and go so that I can check in on you. Okay, sounds good, sounds good. And um, please feel free to submit questions. This is a pretty um, informal, casual, open conversation. So um, Wendy's gonna to stop me and flag me if there are any questions um, that seem to fit in along the way. So um, kind of already did uh, most of these, uh, mentioned my sports medicine and rehab residency that I did through Colorado State University. Um, I have transitioned into a PhD program here at CSU. I'm in my second year of that program. And it's turned into a really neat collaborative program. Um, Dr. Melissa King and Dave Frisbee are two of my main mentors here at CSU. And it's really morphed into this, um, you know, endeavor to research rehab modalities related specifically to tendon healing. And we've been given multiple opportunities to collaborate with human physical therapists, um, the elite human strength and conditioning, athletic coaches, 
um, and human PhD researchers. So it's ended up being this, this really neat program that I'm, I'm very proud of. So you will see throughout this presentation a lot of translational vibes and that's, that's where that comes from. Um, I'm also a partner and a co-founder in a company I'm very proud of called Equine Core Inc. or Ecore. Um, it's a company that's based out of Colorado that Dr. Melissa King and I started a few years ago. And we're actually hoping to make um, specialist level rehab care more accessible to everyone. Um, so we will actually build um, tele-rehab programs. We have an online portal that owners can submit videos to um, or veterinarians. And, and we can then build at home um, veterinary prescription overseen rehab programs. So um, it's definitely, you know, two days are not the same. It's been super interesting and really fun to see that business through. Um, I'm also the partner in managing rehab veterinarian at Equine Sports Medicine and Rehab or ESMR. That's a rehab center located in Whitesboro, Texas. Um, my two partners and I in that are also very proud of that business as well. And that's where um, the horses come for on-site professional rehab care. So I do wear a lot of hats. Um, and so kind of moving into um, some of my takes and my passion for sports rehabilitation and, and professional re rehab. So the more and more I work with the human athletic strength and conditioning coaches and the human physical therapists, the more I have come to realize that um, the translational connection between human athletes and equine athletes is quite synonymous. So to just put it in kind of basic terms, you know, we have different levels of athletes that do different things. And specifically for horses, we have these dressage horses who do very graceful, um, very swift coordinated movements analogous to a gymnast. Another example would be a cutting horse um, that would be analogous to either a tennis player or a basketball player that is making a lot of torsional or rotational movements that are very quick and ballistic in nature. We can even take it as far as a three-day eventer being analogous to a triathlete. So asking an athlete to perform multiple types of exercise that require different physiologic levels of fitness. And of course, we have our speed, our speed horses that are analogous to, you know, the human sprinters. So for me, the world of, of human athletics is quite similar to that of, of equine athletics. We have all of these different athletes. They do different things for a living, and they're, they're being asked to perform at these really intense high levels. And so in order to get those athletes performing at those levels, um, whether they're working around like a chronic injury or an acute injury, and they're in a really intense program, these human physical therapists are relying heavily on um, balance, working on strength and coordination, and also a concept of controlled eccentric loading. And the reason I bring up these kind of pillars of rehab of what I call them is because that's kind of what our theme today is going to be in terms of incorporating the use of the surefoot balance pads into a professionally guided rehab program for horses. Um, so it's different, right? Because we can't say to the horses, okay, we'll stand on your left front foot for five seconds and then transition to your right front and hold that pose. So we have to get creative on the equine side of things. And as you know, Wendy, it requires a tremendous amount of horsemanship and that connection between the handler and the horse is so important into getting a lot of these things done safely, both for the handler and for the horse. But we take these root concepts, right? So we take this concept of we want to work on balance, we want to work on strength and coordination, and also provide a means of controlled eccentric loading and weave that into um, our custom plans. So the caveats for me, um, and I apologize when I'm going to go on a tangent for just one slide here, um, but for me, rehab for horses is something that's not machine driven. And what do I mean by that? I mean it's not defined by the physical pieces of equipment that you have access to, meaning you don't have to necessarily have a $2 million rehab center in order to provide a level of rehab care for your athletes. 
was it, what it is instead is expertise driven. And what does that mean? Well, that means that you are sitting consciously considering the altered biomechanics um, that a horse may be experiencing as a result of an injury or a chronic functional weakness. And you're also taking the time to consider those comorbidities or those things that come along with the original injury. And an example of that might be muscle loss, might be muscle weakness, or differences in balance um, side to side. So I'm a big proponent of what I call multimodal physical therapy. Multimodal just means we incorporate a lot of different aspects of physical therapy and occasionally machines that may be appropriate for that horse. But we're using a lot of those things and we're strategizing their use in order to come up with a more global approach. And for me, rehab is, is absolutely the most effective when it's custom in nature. So every single plan for every single horse is different. It's patient specific, and it's also very dynamic. So it changes with that horse's progress. And it oftentimes involves a whole entire team. And I call it the horse's glam squad, right? So they have a farrier, they have a trainer, um, they have oftentimes a handler that knows them very well. They have a regular veterinarian. They might have an outside professional such as myself who's consulting on the case. So it really is an entire integrated um, team approach to best work with these athletes. And the world according to Sherry is that um, in terms of equine rehab, oftentimes you have a horse that has an ori original injury. So it may be a very specific diagnosis that your veterinarian has decided through the use of MRI um, or diagnostic blocking or the clinical exam. But yes, it is about that injury, but it's also about the secondary muscle weakness. It's about subsequent pain and functional restriction and also secondary loss of balance and neuromotor control that end up leading us to the cascade of despair. So taking this concept and applying it to equine rehabilitation, we ultimately want to integrate a global approach to the equine athlete. So again, not just looking at the horse's specific injury and even the limb of injury, but considering what's happening to that horse's whole entire body as a result of that injury. <clears throat> so before I go any further, is there any questions, Wendy, are we good? I think we're good. I haven't, I'll just check the chat here real quick. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to hear you talk about this, uh, about the holistic approach, because that's really what, um, I don't know if you know Dr. Joyce Harmon. Um, she's a holistic veterinarian here in Virginia. She's a good friend of mine and it's where my horse lives. And w for years we've talked about this holistic approach and I've actually made a little wheel that talks about teeth, feet, back, saddle, rider, and nutrition, because yeah. if any of those spokes are out of balance, it's going to pull the whole thing. And this is that same idea of a global approach to whether it's what's happening or how we treat it. I, I just love hearing you say that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, <clears throat> So um, the things that I consider when I'm developing each one of these custom plans for these horses, I call it, you know, what are the boxes that we're going to check? Well, the boxes that you're going to check to ensure that you are applying a global approach to the equine athlete within the rehab setting is that you want to work on augmenting any functional weakness or compensation that that horse may be experiencing. You ultimately want to improve their comfort, and that's again, different for every single horse. Improving comfort might be they can walk comfortably from their stall to a small paddock, or improving comfort might be um, they experience less pain in discipline-specific maneuvers, ultimately having a better quality of life. We always wanna work on the global fitness of each athlete, but that oftentimes comes with injury-specific considerations. So yes, we want to provide a safe, um, way for those horses to exercise, potentially without concussive forces, um, but they may not be able to do that really high intensity level of exercise that they would normally be doing um, when we are talking about horses in the rehab setting. And specific pertinent to this conversation, we always want to work on balance, neuromotor control, and coordination. And I use this um, ex extensively, whether I'm working with an injured horse or a horse that's healthy and actively competing, competing successfully at a high level, but might have some what I call orthopedic baggage or some sticky spots that we need to work on. 
And ultimately, I always want to try to improve strength, flexibility, and range of motion um, in these equine athletes. So again, everything that I'm going to discuss today, the overarching theme is that it's extremely patient specific um, and needs to have some level of progressive customization. So gradually titrating um, things and making it appropriate for that specific horse. And I do have to ha um, take a moment and just discuss that, you know, there, there are considerations for safe use of surefoot balance pads um, within injured horses. So first and foremost, always, always, always consult with your veterinarian before and during the use of these pads specifically for injured horses. Um, the importance of that initial and ongoing patient assessment through your veterinarian is extremely important and will help guide the safe use of these pads. And we're going to talk a lot about their titrated use. So not going guns a blazing, you know, initially, but kind of gradually working these horses that do have injuries, um, slowly introducing the use of pads so that it's safe for everyone involved. And I'm a big proponent of the Surefoot Balance pads, um, but they are not a fix-all. So I don't want anyone to leave this webinar thinking, oh, my horse has this injury, I'll start using the Surefoot pads and this is magically gonna fix everything. That is absolutely not the case. You should consider the, the Surefoot Balance pads to be an arrow in your quiver um, and certainly not a fix-all. So for me, it offers um, one way or one pillar of the multimodal rehab that I'm able to provide my horses, um, but it certainly is not, you know, the whole program is not dependent on these pads. And there are contraindications for the use of the pads. You can make things worse. And so, um, you know, no one wants to receive that phone call or have that discussion. So again, just work very closely and have an open, honest conversation with your veterinarian um, before you go down that road. Mary, can so, you give us some, some examples of what could be made worse, like in, the, in that idea? Yeah, so you always want to think about a horse's ability to bear full weight on one limb because when you're putting pads on the limb, whether it's one limb or all limbs, you're going to have to think about their comfort in order to do that. Any injury that has introduced instability in the lower limb, um, so much so that you are having a biomechanical um, weakness or functional instability as a result of that is going to be dicey. An example of that would be a collateral ligament injury within a coffin joint. I'm extremely careful with those. Um, you know, soft tissue injuries that may be exacerbated by certain biomechanical movements, for example, extending through the fetlock or dropping through the fetlock. Um, you know, fractures, if they are not <clears throat> at a point of stable and adequate healing. Um, there's, there's many, many examples, Wendy, of, of things that could potentially be made worse. Um, and it all depends on the extent, severity, um, and the, the original injury itself. But those are a few things that um, you definitely want to, to be mindful of. Yeah, I always recommend to people if when they talk to me about an injury is to make sure they talk to their vet. Um, but one of the things I do mention is using the pads with the non-injured legs because they're taking more load. Do you find that that's something important? Um, I do. It's mostly, you know, you do have to consider though that getting them on the pad on the non-injured leg, they're going to be bearing full weight for a brief period of time anyway on the injured leg. And so that's something that always does cross my mind. Is that horse comfortable enough to do that? Um, and I think you'll see through some of these examples about how the application of the pads um, does seem to affect the whole horse and not necessarily just one specific limb. So our ability to perturb or, um, you know, kind of um, adjust the system from a global perspective. Great question. Thanks. Um, I've got a couple of questions here I, let, since we have a little break. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, somebody's asking, what if the vet is unfamiliar with Surefoot? I, I think one of the things hoping I have hopes for this video is that it's something you can share with your veterinarian so they can see that um, it is being used in rehab. Um, and someone's asked, I'm rehabilitating uh, a strained front suspensory and SI sensitivity in a horse. Any thoughts on Surefoot in the rehab combined with various modalities? 
That might be um, something. Go ahead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refrain from providing any specifics, you know, for any specific cases, you know, within this webinar session, Wendy. And it, it's mostly just because, um, you know, having that, that initial in-depth consultation about the extent of the injury, the severity, what's been done, where is the horse at comfort-wise is so imperative to making that decision. So I'm going to um, very respectfully decline in answering the, the specific questions today. But um, I do have my email at the end of this session if anyone has um, specific things that they would like to discuss. <clears throat> but, um, but yeah. I, I'm so, uh, I'm really grateful to hear you say that because, you know, I, I, I have people call me and they ask me about using the pads and, and my answer so much of the time is it depends. I'm not seeing the horse, I'm not seeing, or the rider, you know, I'm not seeing the rider. Um, and so, you know, it's when you see them and, and in your case, when you run your diagnostics that there, you usually find a lot more or something else that wasn't either observed or mentioned. Um, right. Yeah. <clears throat> right. And the last thing I want someone to do is leave this webinar and go tell the veterinarian, well, Sherry Johnson said that this would be good for my horse. That's not the point of today. Um, the point of today is to, is to just educate around some of the ways that rehab is moving towards incorporating the use of these pads. Um, you know, we want to promote this theme of helping the horse and doing more and being more proactive instead of reactive. And so we're gonna, we're gonna move in that vein. And, and I don't mean to dodge the question, but um, it really does depend on so many different factors. Um, yeah, I think it's a super valid point and I respect you highly for saying that because, um, you know, again, it's until you see that horse and look at that horse or do evaluations, there's so much that, you know. You exactly. Could, yeah. Yeah, and I, I love working with other veterinarians. Um, most of the time I learn something and they learn something and, and every, the field advances, right? So if we, if we don't collaborate and we don't open the crosstalk, the field never advances forward. So we've got we've to open the lines of communication. And um, sometimes I work with veterinarians that have never worked with the balance pads and they come up with something I've never thought of. So yeah. it, it's, it, it really is a constantly evolving field and it's, that's one of my favorite things about it. Totally agree. So, so anyways, um, so this session, we're going to talk about the use of Surefoot balance pads, um, how we're incorporating them specifically into professional rehab programs. So again, these are all cases that I um, was directly involved with at the, usually at the rehab center. Um, there is no one size fits all. So there is no blanket. Um, this is what I do for this type of injury. It's these pads for this long for this many weeks. I don't, I don't exist in that world and I don't have any of those cookie cutter recipes. Um, but I am going to talk about some benchmarks and some things that um, horses need to, to be able to safely accomplish before they can progress in level of difficulty with the use of sure foot balance pads. Um, and again, thinking outside of the box, I'm sure that something will come of this webinar where someone will throw an idea out that I haven't actually even thought of. So that's the beauty of these collaborations. So I love this slide. Um, this slide is just meant to reiterate the point that I do use the Surefoot balance pads um, quite extensively. Um, myself and my staff at the Rehab Center in Whitesboro, we probably put anywhere from 15 to 20 horses a day on balance pads in a variety of shapes and forms. So um, I've worked with uh, very broke horses. I've worked with very unbroke horses. I've worked with very injured horses, um, neurologic horses, non-neurologic horses, horses there for fitness, strength, and conditioning. And the use of these pads um, has always been dynamic and something that has uh, fascinated me on a lot of different levels. And we have a lot of cute horses. So this is a way to showcase that. So this first example of what I um, would like to get into is assessment of postural motor control for the neurologic horse. And what do I mean by postural motor control? I'm just referring to a horse's ability within this setting to stabilize itself from a core and functional perspective. So this is what I refer to as phase one. The horse in this video um, is uh, very neurologic and I've got him on a set of firm or the green pads um, on both hind limbs. So he's not on any pads up front, but he is on two pads behind. 
And if you watch the difference, this is the same day, just minutes apart, the difference of this horse being on a set of firm pads um, compared to a set of softer pads that are squishier and again, allow us to perturb or kind of push that um, neurologic balance system just a little bit, you can see the dramatic difference that we have there. So um, obviously this horse at baseline was not stable enough to introduce um, more pads than this. So this is one example of a phase one or, you know, phase one might look like um, two pads on the front end or two pads on the hind end, sometimes even only one pad on one limb. Um, it's very case dependent. But if we look at this level of the sway or the instability that the source demonstrated on the blue pads initially, and then we look at what um, the amount of progress that this horse has made even just one week later, it's quite a dramatic difference. And I will point out that this horse is wearing kinesio tape um, in this video. I do not believe it to be causing a substantial difference in his ability to balance on the pads. Um, but you can see even after just a week of working with the source and asking him to stand on the balance pads, the dramatic improvement that we're able to make in overall postural stability while he's on these pads. Gary, how often in that week was he on sure foot pads? Uh, five to six days a week. Okay. Yep. And when we think about different neurologic um, conditions. So this case specifically was a case that was diagnosed with equine degenerative myelopathy or EDM, which is a degenerative condition of the spinal cord in horses. Um, this horse, phase one for him, was actually just two pads on the front end. He was actually so unstable behind that it, it wasn't safe to get him on pads behind or really even work with his hind end that much. So at baseline, we start by just asking him to stand just his front limbs on a set of uh, firm pads. And you can see he's just got very subtle um, little shifts right here. He's licking and chewing, so he's not extremely stressed out to be on the pads, but he's also not making a move to get off of them either. And occasionally, I think that horses, when they're exposed to a different um, setting, they're, they're standing on something different that they've never done before. There is a brief moment of insecurity there and lack of confidence. So horses will tend to just stick on those pads. Um, 30 days later, we have this horse again up front, just on a set of squishier blue pads. And you can see he's looking around, he's looking down, he's kicking at a fly. So his own internal, um, you know, confidence and ability to casually be on the pads has dramatically improved. Um, in, a, in a time span of 30 days or so. And what does, if that was phase one, what does phase two look like? Well, phase two um, is, a, is a, all four limbs on pads. And again, it can be different. It might mean that there's green versus blue. You can switch them behind, whatever the case may be. But you can actually see from this video, this is the original horse that swayed so much in the beginning. And now he's making those subtle micro adjustments um, on his pads. And you can see that um, just from, and he's stepping off the pads now, but if we go back to the beginning of that video, you can actually see, you know, these very small micro adjustments. And many of you on this call have witnessed these, but these small little um, micro adjustments that these horses make. So again, um, this is a neurologic horse and just observing how his system is perceiving that change in texture of what he's standing on is really quite interesting. So we were able to gradually work this horse up to all four pads um, on all four limbs, and then eventually able to um, work this horse up to being on all four pads. Again, we have different pads on different limbs now. Can I just, and, um, someone's asked a question about the different pads. Can I just answer that question? Yeah, okay. sure. So the surefoot pads come in hard, firm, medium, soft, and then there's a hard slant and a firm slant. And the hard slant is an orange top, green is firm, purple top is medium, and uh, blue is the soft. And so they're different degrees of lateral instability. Um, and what Sherry's doing here is using um, the different pads depending on the horse, right? Okay. Yes, correct, yep. And I, um, you know, again, for those of you on this webinar that are very familiar with Wendy and the pads, I probably speak about them a little bit differently because I'm in my own world most of the time. But, um, but yeah, I, 
it's so interesting every time I talk to Wendy, we're using the pads for completely different things. Um, so it's always an interesting conversation. So um, again, and in terms of um, assessing and working on postural motor control in these horses, this kind of last phase or this more advanced phase or phase three for what I call it, um, is a horse on all four pads. Again, this horse um, was the original horse from that video of the sway, and he's now on all four pads, and I'm actually asking him to do a caudal tail pull exercise. So asking him to do a maneuver while he's on the pads. And again, you can see that this, that would not have been possible with him, you know, straight out the gate. This was definitely a work in progress. How, this long, video, how long was it between the first video and this one? Oh, several months. Okay, yeah. Several months. Of and the working. person's just kicking at flies? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I noticed that after I put this video in. So, and this horse on the lower right, he's performing a lateral cervical bending exercise. Um, he's not necessarily neurologic, but the, the example is just to show that you can start to ask these horses to do more compound, difficult movements while they are on the pads. Um, you know, after you've had a chance to assess them and dynamically titrate their use throughout their program. Um, somebody's asked a question of how you got the horses so even on the pads. Uh, uh, the question is, how did you get such uniform standing on the pads? It's just all when I, I hit record on the video, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, that's always a struggle, right? Like some horses are going to stand on the pads better than others. Um, and I, do you see my, that change with, with uh, repeated use? Say that again? You see it improve with repeated use, like the first time they stand kind of poorly and then they start to gradually improve yeah. when they stand? Yeah, I think so. And I think, you know, a lot of it is just being careful in, in how the situation that you're putting the horse in. So anytime we're working with the horse on the pads, it's a quiet, there's not barn commotion, there's not dogs running around, there's not children flying around. Um, you know, most of these pads are all, the horses are out of cross ties, so they're either loosely held, um, they're, you know, just kind of, the, the lead rope is like looped around a stall or a, a wall, um, but working with them safely um, is, is really, really important. And I'm sure in your clinic, you work with people a lot and just orienting horses to the pads. So the first thing that I do, bef the first time that I ever put a horse on the balance pads, and, and my staff does this as well, is um, we get the horses used to the pads flopping on the ground mm -hmm. because yep. <laughs> they step off of them and the pad flips up and it hits them and it scares the bejesus out of them, right? So um, you want them to be comfortable and to, to realize and know that those pads are going to move they're going to flip, they're going to make a noise, they're going to, you know, kick up some dust. So before the horse is ever asked to stand on the pad, the horse is actually desensitized with the pad. So the pad touches their legs, their forearms, their chest, they smell the pad. They, um, you know, we don't ask them to stand on the pad until they are comfortable um, in that situation. And sometimes we work with the horse for a full week before they even stand on the pads. I'm we so want the pads, yeah, we want the pads to be a positive experience. We do not want them to be associated with a negative um, experience. So. Yeah. When, when I'm teaching people, I, um, I have them hold the pad out to offer to the horse and really watch the horse's reaction. If there's any kind of ear yep. cocking or snorting or anything, you know, it's like, you got to really break it down and back off. So exactly right. It's not all horses are just going to let you just stick them on a pad. And so it's, yeah. I always tell people it's the first time you put a horse on the pad is when you have to be the absolutely most careful to be really observant and notice what's going on because th they might step on it and then suddenly discover they're on it and react. That's yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that, you know, that can't be overemphasized in terms of the safe use of the pads. Yeah. Um, so in, I had a, a very well-respected veterinarian I work with regularly who, who said to me at one point, well, aren't you kind of using these pads as a diagnostic tool to tease out which horses are neurologic and which horses are not neurologic? And I thought, well, that's an interesting concept. So let's play a game. 
So we watch a horse um, diagnosed with EPM, and these are horses that are on similar configurations of pads. They're not particularly all exactly the same, but it's just for demonstration. We have a horse here that is um, post-op basket surgery or post-cervical um, stabilization surgery. We have another EPM case here, and you can see the neurologic horses, they're all demonstrating some level of sway while they're on the pads. And all of these videos are kind of relatively the first-ish, the fir within the first few sessions of being on the pads. And then if we take a horse that's not neurologic and not lame and is, you know, basically considered normal and we put him on the same-ish configuration, you can see that he also demonstrates sway. So what does it mean when a horse sways on the pads? I don't think it means they have necessarily neurologic deficits, but what it does indicate to me is that there's some level of postural stability that can be improved through the integration into the rehab program. So that's as far as I've gotten with it. Um, I have no research to back any of that up. It's just my own observations, but I don't think anyone at this point in time truly knows. We're all trying to figure it out, right, and, and work through it. Absolutely, and I, you know, I show people video and ask them all the time what they think's going on, and people will always talk to me from whatever perspective is their perspective. Yeah. Um, but in the end, I think everybody's right because we're looking at, it's that old story about the adage about the elephant, and we're all coming at it from different parts, and we each have our own perspective, but it's still an elephant. Um, yes. Yes, very much so. Absolutely. So we may learn in, in another two years and I look back on this webinar and think, why well, uh, I said really silly things. Um, so the point is it's evolving and we're still learning. I'm also using the pads um, for what I call prehabilitation or pre-rehab um, for horses that are scheduled to undergo major orthopedic procedures. Um, but they're in my care trying to get stronger and better in order to prepare them for that procedure. So the inspiration from this again comes from the human physical therapy medical world. Um, this is a really interesting paper that I've got on the lower left hand side of the screen and um, these researchers looked at the amount of fluid, so effusion means fluid, the amount of fluid in a joint and how it affects the actual um, muscle contraction or inhibition um, in the rehab setting. So how do, so say you sprain your ankle and your ankle gets really a lot of fluid in it. Um, based on just having that inflammation and fluid around that joint, we know that there's altered um, muscular input to your body's neurologic system and it's not necessarily a good thing. So having that altered muscle function can subsequent, subsequently lead to weakness and put specifically human patients at an increased risk of falling or re-injuring. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the neurologic system is hugely important in um, helping prevent falls and helping prevent re-injury, and that the interplay between muscular strength and neuromotor control is a hugely important balance as well. So this photo, we have a horse standing on balance pad behind, again, performing like a lateral or a caudal tail pull exercise works all of these various muscle groups. So the biceps fem, the tensor fascia lata, the superficial gluteal, and the middle gluteal muscles. So I am using these pads um, for prehab in certain cases um, where I'm trying to get strength gains within a safe, uh, low intensity setting. And then one of my favorites um, is a concept called controlled eccentric loading, and I'm um, big into the tendon research. I love researching how tendons heal and how they respond to injury. So I am using the balance pads for a lot of various tendon injuries, soft tissue injuries in the lower limb of horses. And this is a video of phase one. This is an example of a benchmark. So the horse has to be able to safely perform a wither pull exercise. So we're just asking this horse, we're literally pulling it from its withers, um, asking it to gently shift weight onto each uh, limb at a time. And you can see just this very subtle drop right there in the weight shift. And what that's doing is it's eccentrically loading a lot of the distal limb or the lower limb structures of this horse. Eccentric loading refers to lengthening and it can either be of a muscle um, or the tendon or the muscle in the tendon that are connected. And that specific stretch has been shown to be quite therapeutic for tendon healing on the human side of things and how humans do it. They do these Achilles tendon exercises or heel raise exercises. 
Um, but the trick is you have to do it in a very controlled and safe way, right? So I can't ask a horse to stand on the ledge of a stair and slowly lower its weight. So what I do is I use these pads. Um, once the horse is comfortable doing this phase one, I'll transition them onto more of a hard or a firm pad and ask them to do the same thing. And again, I've, I've, I'm not jump. oh, and the cat is making a guest <laughs> appearance here. I'm not jumping from um, a wither pole to a wither pole on green pads. I'm usually going from a wither pole to standing on the green pads to eventually a wither pole on the green pads. And if we want to take this even a step further, we can ask the ho horse to stand on a, uh, the yellow slant pads and again, perform that same um, wither pole exercise. So again, asking them to stretch and perform a level of controlled eccentric loading through their lower limb. Now with the with more research um, that's planned for the future, we'll be able to figure out biomechanically exactly what's happening. We don't know at this point in time. This is you know, still experimental um, and just clinical observation in nature, but um, with continued research, we'll be able to actually put numbers with what's happening um, when these horses are on the pads and we're asking them to do these things. Wow, that's so cool. Um, and just kind of this last example, so sometimes it's not always a, a tear, a soft tissue injury necessarily, but um, this was a horse with a, an extreme case of uh, flexural deformity or the carpal contracture, both through his inferior and superior check ligaments. And the use of the pads within this setting, um, my goal was to improve his forelimb extensibility or the amount of stretch that he had in his tendons and also to increase his neuromotor control. So I used a lot of heat therapy um, on this horse prior to the use, like immediately before the use of the pad. So you heat up the tissues and then you ask them to stretch. And this and is again, not something an average person should be doing, heating up tendons, right? Uh, no, correct, correct. Okay. No, these, are all, <laughs> these are all veterinary uh, cases, you know, that were professionally rehabbed. So again, I am not advocating that anyone leave this webinar and just start blindly using heat therapy or pads on their horses. These are all things that um, I have specifically been trained to to start to use. So, okay, just little, just wanted to reiterate that. <laughs> yes, yes. Don't don't heat up any tendons. No one's doing any of that. Um, but we were able to make a lot of improvements in this horse. Um, baseline three months all the way out to six months. Was it the surefoot balance pads that caused this difference? No, it was manual physical therapy. The pads made up part of that horse's program. So this was a labor of love. It was a lot of dedication and a lot of work on a lot of um, staff members' parts um, in getting this horse to have this much progress. And there should be like a results vary um, by situation caveat on this slide, but the balance pads were something that were utilized in this case. Um, and I did feel like subjectively they were helpful. So just to kind of wrap this up, Wendy, some takeaways. Um, physical therapy in and of itself is a cornerstone of equine rehab. Um, it's not necessarily about the machines and the fancy equipment that you have, but it's about really considering the biomechanical implications and the comorbidities of each injury. Um, something I have found the balance pads useful um, is to work on neuromotor control, to work on coordination, um, to provide different ways of targeted strengthening exercises, and also a mechanism to provide eccentric loading. Um, again, cannot emphasize enough the level of progressive customization that comes with these pads, and always, always, always consult with your veterinarian regarding their appropriate use for injured horses. So, um, please always take that um, into consideration and default to your veterinarian. So that is all I had officially prepared, Wendy. Um, I don't know if we'll open it up for questions now or... Sure. Um, so if anybody has any questions, you please put it in the chat. Um, we've had a couple. Um, let's see. What was your thinking about using pads and diagonal pairs, soft on one diagonal and hard on the other? So I guess the question becomes, have you used the pads on diagonals as opposed to just front and back? I have. Um, and again, it's 
it's dependent on the horse, but once the horse for me has stabilized with like blues on the front or blues behind, or once they have gotten comfortable um, being on the pads and the pads are the same left to right, my next move sometimes is to switch it up and put them on diagonals um, so that they are maybe blues right front, um, left hind, and a different color of pad on the other diagonal. And the horses that really progress very nicely and are uh, physically stable enough, sometimes we put a different color of pad on a different limb each day. Um, if there's not an injury that we're worried about worsening in terms of like the texture of the pad, we'll actually dynamically change it up. And that's important to continuing to challenge the balance system. So you, you get used to things, things get easier and you want to step the level of difficulty up. Um, but again, that's got to be a, a, you know, that's a decision I'm making as a veterinarian, um, not necessarily for the lay person. Right. Have you ever stacked them? You know, Wendy, I, I haven't. And uh -huh. I wonder if I should start doing that, you know, okay, based you on want to share your screen. I can share some pictures of some okay. um, I, One of my guests this week was Felicitas von Neumann Cosell, and she is a Grand Prix dressage trainer in Maryland, and she has done a lot of stacking. Um, and so I'll just, this will just give you some ideas. I'm yeah. just gonna get over to that screen. Um, maybe you can just look at the chat and see if there's any questions you can answer while I'm going to find my pictures. Sure. Here's a good question. Have you done any EMG tests with and without the pads? Great question. No, I have not, but yes, I would love to. And I hugely expect that uh, researchers moving forward um, would, would definitely investigate something. So what are the, the muscles actually doing from an activation standpoint while on the pads? Great question. Yeah, and I think that's the question Dr. Adair and I talked about. Dr. Adair at UT Tennessee um, was, uh, talking about uh, having a grad student look at muscle activation in horses while they're yep. on the different densities. Yep, yep. And Dr. King, I know, you know, as well here at CSU, her and I have spitballed a few research ideas on the surefoot balance pads and um, we haven't- I can't tell you how much that excites me. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't formally done anything yet, but I know in the, within the next five years, I think more research definitely will come out because I have so many people that are, um, they say, well, what's the research behind it and how does it, how does it work? Um, yeah. You know, um, so before we get to that question, which I do want to ask you, here's an example. Felicitas has, has put the horse on three pads in front and two pads behind. Um, and you can wow. see, that, yeah. And so she's, she does this regularly. Hang on, let me get another window up here. Um, I have a whole series. Let's see if I close that one. Maybe I can. Oh, wait. I, okay, I got to get back to my screen share. Um, well, this is actually an interesting. Oh, not the one I wanted. Hang on. Stop share. I've got too many windows open. There it is. Um, and no, why do you want to keep? Don't show me that one. Hang on. I'll get there. Do do do. Not that one. Um, she's done quite a bit. She's been doing this for years now, about two years. And um, the first time she put a picture up on Facebook with a horse stacked, I was so curious. I had to drive up. She's about two hours away. I had to drive up and see what she was doing because I, you know, I had never, I had stacked a horse once on three pads, but never, um, it was a barrel racing horse. And here's a, here's a cute picture. Okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> just so that we have a cute picture. Um, but she's been doing stacking and see, she's even got the kid on the pad there at, <laughs> for two years now. And um, I have more, I just am struggling to get it up clearly. Yeah, oh, I haven't you, I'll have to ask Dr. King if she's used many pads, uh, pads on pads. I have not, it's certainly, you know, something to, continue to experiment with. Yeah, it's, um, so this one actually, she, I'll just share this one. Um, 
she, there, her horses are all used to doing stretches. And so now what she's doing is, and she's used the pads. So now she's stacking them and doing her stretches. That's awesome. And she's actually reduced the number of horses she has in training from 15 to 10 so that she can spend more time with each horse on pads before she trains them. Yeah. So the and pads just live in the corner of the arena and every horse comes out every day and stands on pads, different combinations. Yeah. The, the importance of, you know, taking the time to, to physio to physically warm up the tissues to prepare them to work is huge. I mean, the, the human athletic world, Michael Jordan never went out and did a slam dunk without stretching and warming up first. So I consider it almost to be within that realm of, of importance. So I, I think that would be great. So um, in your educated opinion, what systems are we affecting in the horse when we're using pads? Like obviously the muscles, but, um, and obviously the nerves, but how do you, how do you explain this to your colleagues? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't know that we know, um, to be totally fair. I, like I said, I think a lot of the use within the rehab setting is still quite experimental. There's still a lot of work to be done to figure out what exactly we are affecting. Um, but I think at the, at the minimum, you know, we're affecting the proprioceptive input that's relayed back to the brain. So anytime you put something on the limb, whether you wrap it or um, you change, you change something about that stimulus of that horse, you're, you're changing the, the input that's being sent back to the brain and then back down to the body. So that is affecting a lot of musculoskeletal tissue types, um, but we don't know specifically which ones and to what extent and, you know, that kind of thing, but. Yeah, and I, I have a lot of people that um, think about fascia and um, we're, yeah. you know, we're clearly affecting fascia as well. Don't you agree? Yeah, yeah, I think for sure. And it's funny because we're the the field of sports medicine within horses is starting to become much more aware of, of fascia and its role in, in myofascial release techniques and things like that but in the human world it's huge right. like if, if there is a myofascial component to or a myofascial restriction in a human patient like they target it hugely and they i feel like at least on the equine side of things i never really cognizantly targeted it until and I started working with more of the, the human gurus. So um, it's, it's certainly interesting. Yeah, and so um, I, I think you've said it, there's a lot of correlation between the types of rehab we do with people and horses um, in terms of understanding and what systems. Yeah. Um, what would be the biggest difference between rehabbing a person and rehabbing a horse? Um, besides less talk back, probably. <laughs> Horses voice their opinions in different ways, I guess. Um, you know, I, I'm not a, I'm not qualified to work on humans at all. Um, I'm not a, a human physical therapist, or I have zero credentials within that realm, so I, I can't really speak to that too much. But my, the collaborators that I work with that that are qualified to do such things, um, you know, we're constantly think tanking and spitballing ideas off of each other and trying to um, come up with new ways. Like I'll say, well, you know, what are you doing uh, with this type of injury or functional restriction? And they say, well, I'm doing X, Y, Z. And so then I sit and think about, well, how could I do that? And how, how could I take that principle and apply it to horses? And that's, that's where my PhD work has really come in. And um, then this- Do you have a cool. title for your PhD work? Um, it's just translational modalities related to tendon healing. So okay. specifically, um, the use of blood flow restriction training is one of, is, is an example of one of the things that I am involved with. Um, but I'm also really interested in the role of just exercise and tendon healing, um, for, um, animals, for horses specifically. So there's, there's things in the works, there's things coming down the pipeline. I don't want to overspeak, but, um, anything, you know, related to rehab, um, you know, and Dr. King has, she's one of my main mentors here at CSU. She's inspired me, um, to really push the bar and look at things. And, and she, her work has been so pivotal in the use of underwater treadmill or aquatic therapy within the rehab setting. So 
um, I really just try to like keep up with her and make her proud. So, you know, I, I just keep going. It, well, what's really exciting to see is that, that we're, um, we're changing the way we approach things like tendon injuries, which, you know, I mean, I've been around a long time and it used to be you just put them in a stall and let them stay there and not really do anything for them and, until the tendon healed. And I think now we're finally recognizing that there's a lot more that can be done, uh, obviously under the guidance of a, a trained veterinarian, but, you know, there's, there's a lot more we can do now to help these horses and make sure that they fully recover, not just the tendon heal. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, and that's just really, really important. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, besides stretches, do you combine the pads at, at the same time with other modalities, heat, tape, ice? I think you've kind of touched on this, but yeah. what are some I, of the other modalities you're using? Um, I use a lot of things, um, <laughs> but I, I do combine. Um, I combine like, like each custom plan for the horse um, will take into account that I'm checking those boxes like that, that checklist. And I do it in different ways, depending on what the horse, what's appropriate for the horse. Um, but I, you know, as far as the pads go, combining them, yes, I do use heat therapy. I'm a, I'm a big believer in heat therapy and icing, um, stretching and physiologically warming up tissues before you ask them to go into an elongated phase for me is really important. Um, but I would say those are kind of the biggest like stretches and then also some form of thermal therapy um, is really what I'm, I'm using. And um, um, like what makes you change the density of the pad? Like you might start with one density and then you switch to another one. What people ask me this all the time. So it's great to ask you what, what, what yeah. causes you to change the density? What's your thought? For me, it's the horse's original diagnosis or original injury. Um, so if I'm, if there's a soft tissue component and I'm worried about stretching things too much, then I start on the hard pads. Um, I don't start on the soft pads initially. So I really play it by ear and I, I definitely, I never have started a horse just on slants. Um, I've always worked the other way and I'm sure there's other ways I could be doing it. I'm sure there, that we will continue to learn about the strategized use of the pads moving forward, but that's, um, what I have typically used the most. Um, but if I, if a horse is done well with the hard pads and I feel like is now ready for another level of stretch, then I will transition them to a, a, a more soft pad. And the beauty of your pads is there's a whole gradient, right? And you've come out with more and, um, you know, continuing to make, to broaden that line and give us a lot of options to choose from. Um, is I think really important. And I'm so glad to hear you say this because we, we have not conferred on this question ahead of time, but I always tell people start harder and they can gradually move into softer. Good. Per I answered it right then. Perfect. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, let's see if we've got another question here. Um, besides stretches, um, there's, oh, there's just a really nice comment. Um, thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Uh, Hi, Neva. Okay. Oh, oh, Neva. Hi, Neva. <laughs> I didn't see who the comment was from. I was just reading the comment. Um, so, I mean, this has been fabulous, um, Dr. Johnson. This is really so helpful because I, I have so many people ask me these questions and um, it's just hearing from you and hearing how you're using it and the approach you're taking. And um, not only makes me feel better about what I've been telling people, which is, you know, if you have any kind of injury, consult with your vet, start hard, move softer, um, you know, and not have the horse cross tied. That's a huge one. I, you know, I see pictures of that. And to me, the horse is, wants to be able to let their neck down. And if they're cross tied, we're restricting the very thing we want to help, help, right? Yeah. The softening in the neck, the lowering of the head. Um, we do have one question is how long do you usually stand the horses on the pads? And um, somebody's asking about getting them in Ireland. I'll just type an answer to that. Um, how long do I usually stand them on the pads during a session? I start anywhere from two to three minutes at a time, and I work up from there. Um, again, depending on uh, comfort, horses, mental status, um, diagnosis, all of those things. But I, I don't go over, you know, a few minutes for the first session. We see how it goes if they step, step off of the pads. Um, the biggest thing I think I would tell someone would be um, don't tie the horse 
yeah. when you're using the pads, like ever. Um, if it's loosely, you know, just around, you know, kind of hung through something, that's fine. But um, for me, that's a big safety consideration. Um, yeah. And, you know, a horse, occasionally you'll have a horse that wakes up on a day and today is different and they don't remember that they've been standing on the pads for weeks and they look down and it's, you know, like a, wow. I guess. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, just never trust them to make good life choices. Yeah. Always assume that they are going to make a poor choice um, and just be, be ready for that. Have, be, have your head in the game. Right. You know, people, um, I always tell people, you really want to be present while the horse is on the pads because your observations are as important as the horse standing on the pads. Yeah. I'm a big believer of quantum physics. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. And we've had two other questions that whether or not you use the non-colored side, you obviously can use the, uh, the other side, the non-colored side. I don't know if you do. Um, I haven't. Um, you know, and, and for me, no one has asked like how long the pads last yet for me. I have worn them out, Wendy, I hate to tell you, but I have put enough horses on them and, and I've bought several um, sets of pads from you over the years, but um, they last a long time, you know, especially if you're taking good care of them, um, depending on the shoe, you know, the racehorses that we get in, if they have clips, obviously that's um, going to um, hinder things a little bit more, but um, all and in all, what, 15 horses a day, five days a week? Yeah. Yeah. The, they weren't actually ever originally intended for that level of use. I think you and Felicitas are my two really intense users. So uh, send me some pictures. We'll talk afterwards. Send me some pictures of your pads. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's cool. And I, I'm really, I think her and I would get along very well. Yeah, and we're going to have to hook you two up. For she's sure. very like-minded. Yeah. So. Yeah. She's an early adopter and very curious and always experimenting. And so I think when you start to see some of the things that Felicitas has been doing, it'll spark a lot of ideas. Yeah, I think so too. Well, um, we've come to the end of our hour. Um, all these meetings are being recorded. I've checked that the recording is on. Um, you can find all of the webinars on my YouTube channel, Surefoot Equine, and I'll post them up on the Surefoot Equine Facebook page please join Surefoot Equine. And if you like, join the group Fans of Surefoot where you can ask questions. And we have a really great group of people now that, that can respond to your questions. I wanna thank you, Dr. Johnson, so much for joining me today. This has been just an amazing hour and um, I'm really looking forward to spending more time with you in the future. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for everyone that, that attended. Yep. All right, and so tomorrow I have a very special webinar. I have Dr. Uh, sorry. Um, he's not a doctor. I have Nigel Casserly, who was the voice of the Rolex 3D event for 36 years. He's going to be joining me tomorrow at three o'clock for a webinar. It's, it's, uh, you don't have to register, but you better get in early because it's limited. And um, he sent me a great video from, from um, 1982. I, I don't even want to ask Dr. Johnson how old she is. <laughs> 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 um, because I was in Lexington as a grad student at University of Kentucky studying equine reproductive physiology in 1982. And um, so I was there during that one. Um, it's really fabulous film. It's great quality. And we'll be showing a bunch of that and talking to Nigel and learning more about the thrills and spills of the three-day event in Kentucky. So please join me since it's been canceled. This is the best way to catch up on Rolex and um, so I'll see you tomorrow. And thank you again, Dr. Johnson, for joining Thank you, Wendy. Take care. Yep, bye-bye.